Okay, great. All right, so yesterday we had a kind of whirlwind tour about how you might, for various, the G, look at um, G number fields uh, and maybe count, you know, maybe count them, ask them privately, and and somehow I in spirit behind counting them asymptotically is like, you know, producing some list, sort of knowing what they are. Now today, we're going to imagine you already have, have those, those number fields, and then you want to ask among those number fields, not just how many are there, but what kind of behaviors do you see? And the behavior we're going to focus on today is the class important invariant of number fields. And so um, the, yeah, so the question is th for today is on the distribution of class groups of number fields. So if you have some number fields, our K over Q number fields, and they're varying, the question is what's the distribution of the class group of K? And w in this lecture series for, um, for simplicity, we are mainly going to focus on the CLO P subgroups. So I'll write it like this. Um, for the CLO P subgroup um, for a prime P. Uh, so the class group is a finite abelian group. It's a product of its CLO P subgroups and we'll mostly be asking for one, one P at a time. Um, you know, what distribution of abelian P groups do you see as you look among your uh, number fields? So if we take the kinds of families of number fields that we were talking about yesterday, one kind of question you could ask um, is, uh, is, is this question here. What are the number of extensions of discriminant, say, bounded by x, that have uh, some particular uh, class group divided by the total number of extensions you are considering? And if we want to sort of think about all the, the number fields, um, We'll let let x go to infinity, and and th this this is asking you know how often do you see which CeeLo p subgroup um, among class groups? So yes. <laughs> oh, sorry. I that that's just a poor um, poor writing. Thank you. I don't. I didn't mean to say that. I meant to say as as k where k as k, you know. Uh, for k some number field, as k, uh, that was just an abbreviation for writing k as a number field. As k, you know, number field varies. Um, thank you. Um, what's the distribution of the class group? And more generally, um, we should ask, um, n over other, other functions of the class group that you might want to average, um, what, what, what are their averages? So this is saying, as I sum over k in some, I wrote f here, some family. So I'm also trying to open the idea that maybe we won't just take these families we were counting last time, g extensions, but maybe we'll put some other conditions um, on our, um, on our num number fields. And you know, we can, say, count them up to discriminant x. Uh, and then on the other hand, we can, can sum any, any function we want of their, th of their class groups uh, up to x, and then we could take that ratio to, to, to get, and this is supposed to be um, the average, you know, this is the average of f over class groups of k for k in this family. And really, if I want to be general, there's one more thing I should generalize. What I wrote here, you know, we would say is ordered by discriminant because the way I take this limit is the discriminant up to x. And so a more, more general uh, thing to do here would be to consider maybe some more general invariant um, of the number fields, and th which could be the discriminant, it could be some other invariant. And then this, this thing here is, you know, the average of of some function f over class groups for k in some family of number fields by, by some invariant. So that's the sort of most general question you could ask about how the class groups of number fields um, in a family behave. All right, so um, for 
uh, this lecture and the lecture tomorrow, we will mainly um, be focusing on quadratic fields. After all, um, one thing to say is implicit in, in, in either of these questions, this original question or the more general question, is the denominator, right? Our, the denominator of these questions is about counting the extensions in the family. So that's what we were, we're talking about. So it's like, oh, now um, we, we have a problem that has a numerator and a denominator. The denominator is the kind of question we had last time. Now, of course, in the case of quadratic fields, we saw that you can really count quadratic fields, so at least the denominator is not scary in the case of quadratic fields. All right. And so one of the first things uh, you might notice when you're thinking about the class groups of quadratic fields is if you have any experience with them, either theoretical or empirical, that you will notice that the class groups are quite different uh, for imaginary quadratic fields versus real quadratic fields. Well, what do I mean by that? One of the many things um, uh, is that uh, the imaginary quadratic fields have much larger class groups if you look at them empirically. Um, and we know, for example, it's a theorem that there are only finitely many imaginary quadratic fields with trivial class group. On the other hand, um, for real quadratic fields, it's a quite open conjecture of Gauss that there should be infinitely many real quadratic fields with class number one. So since that behavior of class groups uh, from the imaginary quadratic case to the real quadratic case is quite different, that suggests that one might want to consider these families not just to say be all quadratic fields, but perhaps divided um, by some other conditions like which ones are imaginary and which ones are real. Okay, okay they're finite abelian groups, and we know what all the, the, the finite abelian groups look like. And it turns out for the class groups of quadratic fields, there is one further thing um, that we know, uh, which is what genus theory tells us. And so I'm going to explain now what genus theory tells us, since this is a um, uh, a lecture series, often you'll hear, okay, and genus theory tells us something, so we'll ignore that. I'm going to actually get into and tell us um, what genus theory tells us, and I'm going to, um, uh, again, kind of like yesterday, I'm gonna, going to, to give it through a very um, general lens, through the lens of class field theory. Of course, Genus theory for quadratic fields was understood by Gauss in terms of binary quadratic forms, and one can understand it quite concretely. Um, however, I'm going to explain it today through the more modern lens of class field theory because that same lens can be used to understand what this kind of phenomena is in other situations where the same uh, concrete approaches don't necessarily apply. So, um, okay. All right, so a class field theory, first of all, tells us about the class group that it's the Gawa group of the Hilbert class field, the maximal unramified abelian extension of K. So we have, this is for any number field K, um, that the class group is isomorphic to the Gawa group of, of this specific uh, canonical extension of K. So if you haven't seen that, that's like a m miraculous thing. Like, why should such a thing be true? This was about ideals and principal ideals. Okay, that's a, a beautiful, beautiful miracle of class field theory, but we're going to just um, take that and use it. Okay, um, and what genus theory tells us about is the following thing. So if I have, this is my extension K, if I have an abelian extension, E over Q, of course, this, this extension, EK, if I take the composite extension, this EK over K will also be an abelian extension. And if that extension happened to be unramified, then it would be contained in this maximal unramified abelian extension. And genus theory is about when that happens. Okay, so I'm going to define a genus field to be the maximal extension of K that is unramified and abelian so that it will be um, 
you know, part of this, uh, part of this Hilbert class field, this maximal unramified abelian extension. And it should be a composite. It should be of the form EK for some E over Q abelian. Now, you know, not every abelian unramified extension of K has to come about this way. And maybe not, you know, maybe you could think maybe none do. But all right, th there are some in that you can see that there is a maximal one because if you have two, you take their composite and it would still be, be such a thing. Okay? Um, and so whatever this, this genus field is, the maximal unramified abelian extension of K that we can get by pushing up here an abelian extension of Q, um, it's, uh, since it, it is a subfield of this maximal unramified abelian extension, by Galois theory, we have a quotient uh, from the class group of K to the Galois group of this, uh, this genus field over K, and so that is the genus group. So that's, you can think of as some piece of the class group. Yes, question. No, no, I did not, yeah, no, I didn't say that the maximal uh, unramified abelian extension is of the form EK. It, it, in, I mean, in some case it could be, but mostly it is not. Um, uh, th just that, that kind of tautologically almost, that there, there is some maximal um, abelian unramified extension that is of the form EK, where E over Q is abelian, and whatever it is, because by definition it's unramified at abelian, it is a subgroup. So EK, or subgroup, sorry, subfield. It's a subfield of the maximal unramified abelian because by definition it was unramified in abelian. So, um, so because of that, by Galois theory, its Galois group over K will be a quotient of the class group of K. Um, and, and what, so that provides us some piece of the class group uh, piece, by which I just mean quotient. Um, all right. And so what can, what can EK be? What kind, of, um, what kind of unramified abelian extensions of K can we get this way? So class field theory and... When I, a lot of uh, these th the, the claims that I make, many of them are spelled out in more details uh, and with some exercises so you can really work through them in the notes. Um, but I'll just tell you that, that class field theory tells us that this Galois group of this genus field um, is the semi-direct product of so this is the Galois group of the genus field over Q. So going all the way down to Q. Um, and it, first of all, you might think, oh, it's not even clear that it's Galois, but it is Galois by the usual kind of argument uh, that it's defined by this, this universal property. And the Galois group is the semi-direct product of the Galois group of EK over K with the Galois group of K over Q. Now, of course, it has to be some extension. and uh, so, so there are two facts in this, uh, in this claim. One is that the extension splits, but the other and the more important one is that the action, so this is a semi-direct product, and I wrote this minus one here because this Galois group of K over Q, I should say here, now I am talking about the example that, that I said we would focus on, um, which is K is a quadratic field. Okay, so this... Galois group of K over Q, this is just the group of order two. Um, and so to say how it acts on something, we just need to say how the generator acts. And this minus one says it acts by minus one because this is an abelian group. And so you always have an action um, by multiplication by minus one of the group of order two on an abelian group. And it, 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 it's that, that action. Now, on the other hand, so that, that sort of you know, class field theory tells us in some abstract way. On the other hand, it's a composite extension. It's a composite extension. So we actually have a, a much more basic fact that as a composite extension, this Galois group is a subgroup of the, the product of the Galois group um, of E over Q and the Galois group of K over Q. And in this, this here, this action is trivial of, you know, 
I mean, you could say this is a semi-direct product as well, but with a trivial action. All right, so on the one hand, we have that the action is by minus one of the Galois group of, of k over q on this, this piece here. And on the other hand, we have that the action is trivial. So the conclusion of that is that the Galois group of e k over k must be two torsion because of, those, of the abelian groups, the only one on which the action by minus one is the same as the trivial action is if the group itself is entirely two torsion. Yes? Is it obvious why E can't be equal to K? Ah, I count that as two torsion. So if E was equal to K, then it would be the trivial group. And I, we'll, we'll count that as two torsion. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's killed by two. <laughs> so absolutely, it could be the trivial group. So the two torsion includes like the trivial two torsion group, the trivial group, yes. Other questions? All right. OK, so now, not only does class field theory tell us that this group has to be two torsion, um, it can help us find what, what it can be. So what are we looking for? If it's two torsion, that means it's generated um, by, by quadratic extensions. So I'm looking for, for quadratic extensions here. Um, quadratic extensions here that when you, when you push them up, they become unramified. So what does that look like? All right, so here's, here's my picture. So k over q is a quadratic extension. And I'm looking for quadratic extensions f over q such that when I take their composite, um, that this extension L over K is unramified. So that's, that's what I'm looking for. Now, I, you know, of course, it'd be great if we could take F over Q unramified, then this would definitely be unramified. That doesn't work because we know there aren't any, any such F over Q, but maybe, just maybe, um, uh, it is possible to have ramification that, uh, that uh, when you, after you take a composite disappears, and we're trying to look to see if that would happen. So this is my field diagram here. And next to it, so I've drawn the Gawa group. So, so of course, if this is a composite of two quadratic extensions, the Gawa group is going to be Z mod 2 cross Z mod 2. So this is the Gawa group of L over Q. So it's, it corresponds to Q in the, the Gawa uh, diagram. And so I'm going to say that K is the field fixed by, um, by the subgroup generated by 1 comma 0. All right, so that means that the Gawa group of k over q is like the second coordinate here. It's the quotient by this, uh, and the Gawa group of L over k is this subgroup. And so what does it mean if we want L over k to be unramified given this Gawa diagram? Um, L over k is going to be unramified if and only if the inertia in this extension intersects trivially with this subgroup since that's the Gawa group of L over K, right? So I've just, I mean, I've just said, like, for this to be unramified, that means the, all the inertia should, in, you know, in L over Q, should not see or not touch this Gawa group of L over K, which is this, this um, order two subgroup here, right? Okay, so if we think about this, we have the Gal group of Q bar over Q, all the possible extensions. And we already have a K. We're starting with a K. We're imagining we have this K. Its Gal group is, um, is Z mod 2Z. And we're looking for lifts of that. We're looking for L's where the Gal group is Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z. So we're looking for lifts of this to some Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z such that projection here, so this, um, this is... I drew the arrow over on the right because this map is going to be projection to the second coordinate. So we're looking for maps here such as projection to the second coordinate agrees with already the map we have here um, uh, that is, is k over q. And I wrote this th this way in terms of the absolute power group and maps because class field theory tells us uh, what, what s all such maps, maps could be, right? So... Um, um, 
if we have any abelian group, these homomorphisms or continuous homomorphisms from the absolute, oops, there shouldn't have been two bars there. <laughs> the homomorphisms from the absolute Gala group to A, so A extensions here um, are given exactly by homomorphisms of the Adele class group. And um, as we talked about briefly last time, those homomorphisms uh, uh, can be specified by giving a homomorphism from ZP star, the p-adic units, uh, to A for each p. Uh, and this restricted product here means that only finitely many of those homomorphisms are allowed to be non-trivial. Um, but so class field theory is telling us uh, in, this, in this way what all the maps from gal q bar over q to any abelian group, including, say, z mod 2z cross z mod 2z r. So a, a is a finite, finite abelian group? Oh, group? yeah, yeah, let's, uh, finite. Yeah, thank you. Good. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so that means we can replace in this sort of picture where we're looking to lift maps from the absolute Gala group from z mod 2z to z mod 2z cross z mod 2z. We can replace that picture with now, we're trying to do that with not the, you know, the absolute Gala group, but the product of zp stars, okay? The product of, 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 of zp stars. Um, and, uh, and, and it, for these, it's pretty, pretty uh, easy to say, you know, for each of them, what the maps to Z mod 2Z and Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z uh, are. Um, but also, also in this picture, the ZP star themselves are inertia groups. They are the inertia groups in, you know, the image of the inertia groups in this, in this Gal group. So remember, we said, now, we're not just looking for any, um, any Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z extensions of Q. We were looking for ones, I'll just go up here, remember, where the inertia needs to intersect trivially with this, um, uh, this subgroup here um, generated by a, an element non-trivial first coordinate. Okay, so the image of uh, these ZP stars, it, well, I said it can't intersect this subgroup. Of course, it can, it can, I should say it can only intersect it trivially. It can't intersect it non-trivially. And then uh, that doesn't give a lot of, a lot of options. You already know, um, you already know how your ZP star maps uh, to Z mod 2Z, and you want to uh, think about lifts here, but you are not allowed to, to intersect um, t uh, this. And so in particular, if ZP star, um, if P was unramified in K, so remember this is the map that corresponds to our original quadratic field K. So if P was unramified in K, that means that the ZP star here maps trivially to z mod 2z, so the second coordinate has to be trivial, but yet you're not allowed to intersect the uh, subgroup where the second coordinate is trivial, uh, and so there's nothing you can do uh, except to map the zp star trivially in the orange map up above. Um, on the other hand, if p is ramified in k, then that means your second, you're, you're mapping to the second coordinate such that the second coordinate is one, and then you have sort of two ways to lift that. You could lift it to one, one, or zero comma one. Um, all right, and so, what um, this allows us to see is that, you know, from this, from this point of view, the number of ways, the number of, of maps that you could create like this, the number of L's uh, is twice the number of ramified primes because for each prime that's unramified, you have no choices about the map ZP star to Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z. And if P is ramified, you have two, two choices. Um, and now these are, don't quite all give us what we want. Um, uh, first of all, two of these 
Uh, two to the number of ramified prime maps are not surjections onto Z mod 2Z, cross Z mod 2Z. If you always lift only uh, to the, the second coordinate um, uh, or only to, to, to 1 comma 1. Um, and each field, if we care about fields, each field gives two maps. So because of automorphisms of Z mod 2Z cross Z mod 2Z that fix this, you know, the fields correspond to the kernels of the 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 homomorphisms, not the homomorphisms themselves. Um, and some of these things that we constructed, even though we made sure that they were unramified at each finite place, some of them may actually be ramified at infinity. So this is why um, genus theory is usually a statement about the narrow class group. So the narrow class group by class field theory gives you the maximal abelian extension that's unramified at finite places. And this kind of gives a perfect story if you just ask about being unramified at finite places. Um, but in any case, those are sort of some easy things to fix. Uh, and um, uh, when you put it all together, that tells you that this, uh, this genus group, so which we know to be of the form, right? So we said before it's a two torsion group. So it's Z mod 2Z to the K, or maybe I'll call it T. So it doesn't, you know, for some, for some T, right, this genus group, it's, size um, uh, is um, at least 2 to the, the number of ramified primes of k minus 2. Um, one of those, those minus 2s is, is for the second point, and one is for the first. And in fact, maybe I should have said here, I mean, we actually, uh, I can put in the, put in the upper bound uh, as well, um, 2 to the number of ramified uh, minus 1 here. And the reason for this, this question mark about is it minus 1 or minus 2 has to do with whether this question of being ramified at infinity uh, comes into play and cuts things down by a factor of 2 or not. Um, so that's how we can see um, here, all of the all of the unramified abelian extensions of a quadratic field that come from the uh, a composite from Q with an abelian extension, and they give us some two torsion, and we can say basically how much two torsion in terms of the number of ramified primes of K. And of course, we know sometimes we have class groups that aren't just two torsion, so we know that we don't get all the unramified abelian extensions this way. Um, but the moral, the takeaway from this, is that we feel like mostly we know the two torsion in the class group for k quadratic because it, um, uh, the number of ramified primes is, we think of as a pretty basic invariant of the quadratic field. Um, and in contrast, for the whole rest of the class group, uh, we have nothing like this at all. The whole rest of the class group is vastly uh, vastly more, more mysterious. All right, so that brings me to um, the cohen lenstra heuristics. So we're going to fix an odd prime, and the reason that we're going to fix an odd prime is because of this moral here that, well, we know about the, the two torsion and it follows this specific behavior, but for the odd, you know, CELO P subgroups, we don't know, know anything and they seem quite mysterious. Um, and so uh, Cohen and Lindstra made the, the following conjecture um, for an odd prime, uh, which is that, and I wrote it this way, so on the left-hand side, uh, we, so we have some function f, and on the left-hand side we have this average of f over the p torsion in our class groups here, and we're taking imaginary quadratic fields, and... Um, well, and so the sort of two things that we pointed out so far was one, we should probably separate real and quadratic fields. Um, that's happening here. And then that we should uh, perhaps ignore two because, you know, we already know something about genus theory and what's going on at two is why we have an odd prime here. And so this conjecture predicts that for some reason reasonable functions, f, um, that this average should be 
an average over a very concrete distribution that has nothing to do with number theory. So what is on the right-hand side? On the right-hand side, I'm um, summing f over all finite abelian p groups, and I'm weighting each group by 1 over the number of automorphisms of A. All right, now, th since those weights don't sum up to 1 for this to be an average, uh, you know, I, I need to divide by the, uh, the sum of the weights. So this, on the right-hand side, does not, you know, doesn't have any number theory content. It's like a, it comes from the, the, the theory of finite abelian uh, groups and uh, just says with these, with these weights on each finite abelian group, what is the, the average of, of the function? All right. And then we'll see here as well um, the similar... Uh, the, the similar conjecture uh, now, uh-oh, except I forgot to change the, okay. The similar conjecture um, for K real quadratic, um, and it looks very similar. We have just this class group average on the left-hand side, but now just over real quadratic fields. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we have a similar average, except you'll notice that the weights the weights have changed just a, a little bit. They have picked up this additional factor of A. And so, you, um, you know, the sort of first natural functions to consider in these averages would be the characteristics functions, which is like how often do you see a particular group, i.e. f could say, like, be the function that's 1 when you're a particular group and 0 otherwise. So then on this side, you'd get the proportion of fields whose, you know, P towards P CeeLo subgroup. Oh wait, I wrote P. There should be an infinity in these. I mean the kind of I mean of course yeah. CeeLo P so if F is a characteristic function on this side you have the proportion of fields whose CeeLo P subgroup is a particular group, and on then on this side you would get, you know, one over the size of that group, the number of automorphisms of that group, um, uh, divided by this constant. So the moral of that is that among the various finite abelian p groups, when we're looking at CeeLo p subgroups of class groups, we should, of quadratic fields, some group A should appear um, roughly, you know, C over automorphisms of A of the time, where C is some constant that doesn't depend on A, if we're looking at, um, you know, uh, so this is among imaginary quadratic class groups, and this is among real quadratic class groups. Okay. Um, so I want to say that sort of tables of class groups of quadratic fields um, both helped uh, motivate these uh, these conjectures that in, in the data in the tables sort of presented some mysteries that needed explaining. Like, why are you seeing, you know, m m this class group more than this other class group, especially if they're the same size? Like, if you want to compare how often you see as a CO3 subgroup Z mod 3Z cross Z mod 3Z and Z mod 9Z, you might at first think, well, like, they're both s groups of size 9. Maybe they appear roughly the same time, but that's not what it looked like empirically, and these uh, uh, conjectures provide a very precise explanation for what is going, going on there. And of course, the fact that we have very good um, tables help provide evidence for these conjectures, which look 
very, very true. So we have good class groups of, good tables of class groups of quadratic fields, uh, and, and these, these conjectures look, look spot on with those tables. Um, and we'll talk a little more about um, what, what we might be able to do with, with such tables later. But now um, I want to also present another uh, perspective on, on these, these conjectures, um, which I call a matrix model. All right, and so um, this, uh, this perspective uh, uh, comes from a paper of Venkatesh and Ellenberg, and it says, well, let's, let's think of the class group the following way. So I have a quadratic field, K, and I take S, some set of primes of K that are sufficient to generate the class group. So, I mean, it's a finite uh, a group, so certainly there's some, I sh maybe I should have said S, I'm thinking of it as S as a finite set of primes, so there's certainly some finite set. But indeed, you know, even very naively, like we know by the Minkowski bound that you could have some concrete bound in terms of the discriminant that, okay, if I go up to all the primes, of norm, at least this, I'll have a prime in every class of the class group, you know, so certainly enough to generate it. So it's not sort of hard to imagine that you can, get, can, can, can think about, about such a set and being confident that it generated the class group. And once we have such a set of primes, um, uh, we're going to take the S units, so these are the elements uh, of the number field that have trivial valuation outside S. So if S were empty, then these would be the units. But, when, but once we throw primes at S, we're, we're saying, OK, we're allowed to have some, some um, of those primes in the numerator and denominators, kind of, but, nothing, but nothing else. So those are the S units. And then I'll write IS for the S ideals. So these are just the fractional ideals generated uh, by the primes, primes in S. And then I'll write mu sub k for the roots of unity in k. And there's a map from the s units, um, say mod the roots of unity, uh, to the s ideals that says, well, if I take an s unit and I take the principal ideal generated by it, well, that, um, that principal ideal uh, you know, has since I have an S unit, it it doesn't have any valuation outside of S, so it can be written as some product of primes in S with various exponents. So I get a map there. And because I took S large enough to generate the class group, the co-kernel of this map, the quotient of the S ideals mod the image of the S units here, is the class group. Because, I mean, what is this? It's ideals mod principal ideals, except I'm only, um, I am only, only looking at the stuff that involves S, but if S is enough to generate the class group, I'll get the whole class group. Okay, um, so that's a, a way to get the class group. Um, uh, all right, now we were interested in this CLOP subgroup of the class group. And so uh, one way to, uh, to, to pick out just the CLOP subgroup is to not take this map, but just tensor everything involved with ZP. So we're using tensoring with ZP mainly as a convenient way to kill all of the uh, uh, parts of our abelian groups that aren't the, the CLOP subgroup. All right. Um, and so if we actually, so what are these, these uh, groups that we're mapping between. Um, well, they actually, as Z modules, OS star mod mu k, so this is just a free abelian group on S generators, so it's Z to the size of S, sorry, the size of S generators, if um, k is imaginary, or it's Z to the S plus 1 if k is real. So you might have just pr proved that when you proved Dirichlet's unit theorem, or if not, you can use Dirichlet's unit theorem um, uh, uh, to prove th that that's the size of the, the S units. Um, and of course, the ideals, 
The S ideals are just the free abelian group on those primes in S. So they're also isomorphic abstractly as a Z module. So these are just as, Z, as groups. These are just Z to the size of S or Z to the size of S plus 1. And so we can imagine if we picked a Z module basis of uh, these things, it's a little easier to imagine doing that for this group uh, uh, than, than this one. But in any case, certainly there are some Z module bases. Then the reason for doing that is then this map becomes, in particular, this map that we care about becomes a very concrete thing. It becomes a matrix um, because it's mapping zp to the s, uh, size of s to zp to the size of s, or maybe in the real quadratic case, it's mapping zp to the size of s plus 1 to zp to the size of s. So here, so it's a matrix, an n by n plus u matrix, where u equals 0 or 1 according to which case we're in. All right. So if you have these matrices, so for every k, okay, we made some choices, but then we get this matrix, we get this p-adic matrix, and you might wonder, how might these, these matrices be distributed? Like among zp matrices, how are they distributed? And very concretely, there's zp matrices, you could take the mod p, right? And then mod p, you have an n by n plus u matrix mod p, what might you get? And maybe if you have no idea, you'd think maybe they're uniformly distributed. Why not? They could be anything. Um, maybe there are every possible matrix mod p with equal probability. Um, and then, well, what, what would you guess? How might they be distributed? If you have no idea, you might think, well, maybe they're equidistributed as matrices mod p squared as well. And if you sort of continue uh, that, uh, then you would be imagining that the matrices were distributed via Har measure over 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 ZP. So that is just um, so if if you think that they somehow come from a uniform measure mod P on the finitely many matrices and a uniform measure mod P squared, etc., that leads you to say that oh they're distributed over over ZP from the Har measure on on this group. And if you haven't thought about the Har measure on this group, then yeah, it just says the same thing. It's basically there sort of should be maybe uniform mod p and mod p squared and mod p cubed and et cetera. And maybe they're not exactly, but maybe just approximately distributed that way. That's certainly the most natural measure on this space of matrices. Um, and so that um, leads to a random matrix question. Um, if I take say, a random matrix from Har measure. So this n sub p I'm thinking of as a random matrix. That means a random variable valued in these, these p-adic matrices uh, from, from Har measure. What is the distribution of its co-kernels? And why, why did I care about the co-kernel? Because remember that this p-adic matrix that we built, its co-kernel, what, so this is, I'm thinking of as a matrix that actually came from some number field. And its co-kernel is the class group of the number field. And uh, now, I'm, uh, now I'm asking for some matrices that didn't come from a number field. These matrices I'm just saying by fiat, I'm defining them to be the matrices that come from Har measure on this space of p-adic matrices. And what is the distribution of their co-kernels? Um, and so I'm going to briefly, uh, briefly sketch how you could answer this random matrix question, this question about p-adic matrices uh, from, from Har measure, and this is worked out, again, uh, in, in much more detail in the notes. Um, but here's a sketch. Okay, so we want to understand uh, the distribution of the co-kernel. So the co-kernel, right, uh, is uh, zp to the n mod the image of z p to the n plus u, so this is, you know, n sub p, remember, is a map from z p to the n plus u to z p to the n, because it's a matrix, and um, this is the ex what I mean by the co-kernel, and I want to think about when is that isomorphic to some fixed group b. So b is just some, is some fixed, fixed group. And if I want this to happen, uh, for such an isomorphism, there has map from zp to the n to b. 
In fact, I know exactly how many such maps there are. Uh, they're B to the N, and I should maybe say this is sort of a fixed uh, abelian P group, since these are the sort of possibilities that I'm interested in. Um, there, so there are, there are B to the, the N uh, in such maps. I can just send any generator, uh, you know, any of the N standard basis elements here to any element of B. And this question from another point of view, given one maps, what is the probability that that map gives, gives such an isomorphism? Um, and uh, so for such a map to give an isomorphism, first of all, it has to give a map from the co-kernel to B. So this image of our matrix NP has to actually be uh, in the kernel of F. So we need, uh, need this to be in the kernel of F. Well, that just means that the image of each of the N plus U uh, generators should, um, uh, should be in that, that kernel. And uh, since it's a map to B, each of the, those things happens with probability 1 over the size of B. And so that all of them being in the kernel is this probability, the size of b to the n minus u. Um, and then once we have this uh, in the kernel, we need to make sure that there's nothing else in the kernel for this to actually be an isomorphism. Um, and you can compute the probability that this generates the kernel uh, in a pretty straightforward way because it's something that you can check mod p by no Nakayama's lemma. If I have um, this, uh, you know, a, a map of, of Z P modules, and I want to know uh, uh, does, or I say have some elements of a Z P module, and I want to know do they generate the Z P module? I just need to check if they generate things mod mod P. So that's that's a sort of finite computation about whether uh, certain, uh, you know, what the probability of elements. Uh, mod p, you know, vectors mod p will generate a space. And because we're taking everything from Haar measure mod p, it becomes the uniform measure, and this is a, a, a computation that one can do. And that leads um, to the conclusion that, oh, I need to say, so, um, uh, I missed a thing here. Um, so, that the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability that this co-kernel of this random matrix from Haar measure is B is, this is a constant, uh, again, over B to the U times the number of automorphisms of B. Um, and so here, the, you can sort of see the B to the N and the B to the N minus U, they, they combine to give this B to the U factor uh, in the denominator, um, this probability of generating the kernel actually in the limit as n goes to infinity turns into the constant. And uh, this ought b factor comes from the fact that um, I was thinking about actually counting isomorphisms, but if you are isomorphic to b, you'll actually have ought b isomorphisms to b. So by, by counting isomorphisms, um, I've sort of overcounted by a factor of ought b. So that's where that, that comes from in that, that argument. And um, uh, these uh, are indeed, in the, the cases of u equals 0 and 1, uh, the Cohen-Linstra distribution conjectured for the class group of imaginary and real quadratic fields. Um, and so, um, then, then you might, you might, might wonder or hope. Um, so maybe these, if we go back to these matrices that actually had to do with number fields, these matrices that we got from looking at the map of S units into S ideals, whose co-kernels were the CLO P subgroups of our class groups, Maybe those matrices are distributed from Haar measure um, on matrices. Now, there are a lot of uh, things to, you know, th that's not quite a precise statement what I mean by that. I should say, you know, I sort of sneakily took this limit here as n goes, 
times to infinity. Of course, what was in it was it was analogous to the size of the set we needed to generate the class group, um, but we could always use a bigger set to generate the class group, so it seems okay to think of n as being very large. Um, but n isn't fixed. n is, n is, is going to infinity. And so to even say this, this is, they're approximately distributed from Haar measure on this, you need to have some notion of what that means when n is not, is not uh, fixed. Um, but you can make such a notion, and I, I point out in the notes Friedman and Washington, uh, who were thinking about these matrices in relationship to the Cohen-Linster heuristics for function fields, you know, did, did even make such, such a notion of what this just, you know, approximately distributed from Haar measure on these n by n matrices where n is changing uh, might mean. And you might hope that if, if you knew such a thing, that that would then imply the Cohen-Linster distribution for quadratic fields, because we have these, these matrices whose co-kernels are literally the class groups, and then we know that a certain distribution on matrices gives the Cohen-Lenz distribution, and so if at least asymptotically or approximately um, uh, the, the matrices from class groups look like they come from this Haar measure, then, then you could hope that you know, with, with enough precision in what these statements mean that that would imply the, the Cohen-Lenz distribution for quadratic fields. All right. And I just want to say, um, and to even make sense of this, um, uh, to make these matrices, we need a basis for the S units. And that's, a, that's, that's maybe the thorniest piece of the whole thing. Um, I, I mentioned above, to choose the matrix, we also needed a basis for the S ideals, but that's, that's a very natural basis. You just take the primes at S. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, so that is a, a, a thorny thing to... Uh, to think about. Uh, on the other hand, if you are using a computer algebra system that will compute for you S units, it gives a basis. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's, not, it's not like there's not a sort of deterministic way to make, make a basis. Um, and um, in particular, uh, some computations that um, a student working with me a few years ago did suggest that that this thing that you might have hoped for here, that these matrices look like they're coming from Haar measure on matrices over um, ZP, uh, really um, doesn't 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 appear to be to be true. And even if you um, look at aspects that are are agnostic as to the, your choice of basis here. Um, uh, that that doesn't look to be the case, um, and so okay. Uh, so that <laughs> then uh, you might wonder. So so what's going on? Um, what does that mean for this uh, for this whole story? And so now I want to tell you about another random matrix phenomenon. Um, which falls under the, the broad umbrella of universality and probability theory. So it turns out, actually, many more distributions of random matrices have their co-kernels uh, giving the Cohen-Linster distribution besides, uh, um, you know, and the, the key here is not just from Haar measure. Um, so let's say we take any distribution, for example, and this is really kind of the tip of the iceberg, but uh, it will give you the sense. So if we take any distribution on the piatics that is, is not, does not completely concentrate it on one value mod p, all right? So it, needs to, it can't just be a deterministic value uh, uh, that puts the entire distribution on some value mod p. Now I just want to say that is a contrast I'm not saying you have to be uniform mod p. You don't have to see everything mod p with probability 1 over p nice and e even. I'm just saying you can't be completely 100% of the time, you know, 3 mod 7. You have to at least like 0.001% of the time also be 2 mod 7. But you don't even have to see every value mod p. The distribution does not have to be supported on, 
on all the values mod p. It has to just be supported on at least two values mod p. So this is like quite a, this is not just like nearly uniform distributions. This is like everything that is, you know, that is not, uh, that deserves to be called a random element at all. Um, and let's say we took our, our matrix, not with um, har random entries, but entries, so this IID means that the entries should be independent, and they're identically distributed from this distribution. So maybe that distribution is like, is that, you know, you're 97% of the time, you're 3 mod 7, and 3% of the time, uh, you're uh, 2 mod 7, and that's your, your distribution. Um, uh, and so you take a, such a random matrix. So this is, this is not at all like it's coming from Har measure. It's not equally spread around um, uh, on ZP. It's just prevented from being really the same thing all the time. If you do that, um, then one has actually, uh, it's a much more difficult well, result, but uh, that as n goes, the size of these matrices, as n goes to infinity, the distribution of the co-kernels of these matrices is in fact exactly the same distribution as if you had taken the matrices from Haar measure. Um, and uh, so, so it's not, it's not a special thing about matrices from Haar measure that their co-kernels give you the cohen lindstrom distribution. Indeed, it's a very, very general thing. So this is analogous like to the central limit theorem. If you average a bunch of Gaussians appropriately normalized, you get a Gaussian. But the central limit theorem tells you that you don't have to average Gaussians to get uh, a Gaussian uh, as your sort of normalized average. You can put any kind of garbage uh, uh, in, and the central limit theorem tells you appropriately normalized, you get a Gaussian out. And this is, this is in that same, same vein. Um, you can put kind of lots of garbage distributions in to make your random matrices, and you still get the cohen lenstra um, distributions out. So that, I should say, um, shows how, uh, in the sense of universality, universal and uh, important these distributions are. So that leads me uh, to, to um, uh, my final question, which I think is a very interesting uh, question to start pursuing computationally. So what is then, since I said it doesn't look like it's coming from Haar measure, what is the distribution, say empirically, of the matrices that actually define class groups? Um, and can you at least conjecturally look at those matrices, make some conjecture that appears computationally true for for what kind of distribution those matrices are coming from. And then, now a theoretical question, does the universality uh, hold for, for, for that distribution? Meaning, will their co-kernels have the same cohen lenstra distribution? We certainly um, would expect that to be the case, uh, but I think it's an interesting opportunity to, uh, to try to understand these heuristics through a different angle. So that's it for today. Questions? Yeah, yeah. And basically, you can see that. I mean, like, for example, like, if it was always zero mod P. Right, you can e easily see that you'd be something, and then if you're a matrix and you know, like, and you're all two mod p, then mod p you can't have very much rank. So you, yeah, you can easily see that if you took a distribution that was 100% of the time the same thing mod p, you would get like, in fact, a very funky co-kernels um, uh, because the matrices would have have very low rank mod p, and the co-kernels mod p tell you about the p torsion of the groups. Uh, yeah. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, well, th that was so. So the question was when I talked about these these um, 
uh, the vectors that need to be in the kernel were the independent events. So the reason that they are independent events is because we were considering matrices, say like n by n matrices from Haar measure, and a way to get an, an n by n matrix from Haar measure is to independently take each column from Haar measure on just zp to the n on the columns. And so that basically comes from, um, that comes from this, you know, sort of symmetries and the niceness of Haar measure that, that a Haar measure n by n matrix is the same as the independent Haar measure column from each column. All right, let's thank Melanie again.